Hello everybody. This is the sermon for St. Christopher's Church, but you are also welcome to listen to it even if you don't worship with us. Today's Bible passage are from Luke chapter 21 verses 1 to 14 and Romans chapter 15 verses 1 to 6. If you haven't read them, I would like to recommend that you, sp you pause the video now and read the passage first. Thank you. Today's passage reminds me about my childhood and the life in my village. I was born near Lake Victoria. My uncle and many other people in the village were, were and are still fishermen. I remember several occasions when I would go to get fish in the morning at the beach, only to be told that uh, they have got nothing despite fishing all night. And a couple of times when I was involved in a fishing trip, I found it really hard work and draining and actually dangerous at, some, at, at times. I do remember spending almost four to five hours in the night pulling the net only to get a half a bucket of fish. Fishing is a very demanding job and frankly, it can be extremely dangerous. You only need to watch things like the seaside rescue programs that my daughter enjoys to realize how dangerous water can be. Our gospel reading for today puts us right out on the water with Peter and the other disciples following Jesus' resurrection. The disciples are gathered in Galilee by this point when Peter decides he's going fishing and everyone else follows him. One thing we should remember is that Peter and a number of other disciples were fishermen by trade. So this was their job before they, they were called to follow Jesus. Therefore, this is more like getting back to work and I imagine it would have been well within their comfort zone. This story is almost identical to the story we heard from Chris last week, uh, which was read from Luke chapter 5. Except last week we, uh, we saw Jesus calling the disciples to follow him. But today, Jesus is appearing to his disciples after his resurrection. In both stories, we see that despite the disciples' expertise in fishing, they could not catch any fish through the night. This must have been exceedingly difficult for them. I remember in my own life, I find it really difficult to cope well when I'm trying to do something that I'm familiar with or I know what to do, but it doesn't respond the way it should. For example, uh, fixing a computer. It can be very frustrating when we, when, um, what you are doing, you know, is right, but you're not getting a good result. In today's story, even though we don't see any expression of frustration, we know human beings always want things to, get, uh, to go smoothly. And when it doesn't, we're bound to be frustrated. I really love it when I pray and something or someone gets healed. But if I don't see uh, people being healed, I can become frustrated or sad. We are always delighted when we tell someone the news about Jesus and they come to faith. But if this doesn't happen, we can start blaming God or feeling that he is not listening or at work. But in this story, we see that the disciples stuck to their task 
and continued to do what they knew best, fishing. So we start, the, uh, we start with an unsuccessful fishing trip, but then comes this encounter with Jesus. Jesus, after, um, just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach. But the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. He asks if they have caught anything, anything or any fish, and they said no. And he tells them to cast their net on the right side of the boat and they'll find some fish. They do, as this apparent stranger says, and look and behold, the net is suddenly full to bursting. So full of fish they can't even hold it in. The disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord! And Peter jumps right into the water and swim to shore to meet him, leaving the others to drag the heavy net um, the remaining hundred yards. What a demonstration of love that Peter is showing here. He can't even wait uh, for the boat to get to the, to the shore. He jumps into the water and waits, waits to Jesus. In Luke, in Luke chapter 5, last week passage, we see Simon Peter, the sinner, telling Jesus to go away because he was a sinner. However, from today's passage, we see that Peter is running towards Jesus. Why is Peter running towards Jesus when he knows very well he denied him three times? I think... He runs to Jesus because he knows he is loved and forgiven. He understands that Jesus still loves him. He knows he is not going to be judged. Jesus doesn't judge us. He is wanting to restore our failing, our past, our denial of him, our sinful nature. Jesus is wanting us to come back and run to him. Like Peter, are we excited to meet Jesus afresh? It is the time to remember that we are loved regardless of our failing. The passage immediately follow, following this is when uh, Jesus reinstated, uh, reinstated Peter when he asks him if he loves him three times and gives him the command to feed his sheep. But Peter has shown by his action of running to, uh, to Jesus that he loves him, but still Jesus still requires him to confirm this in his words. This must have been painful for Peter, who would have been acutely aware of his failure, but Jesus shows him that he loves him and trusts him despite of this. In the story, we continue to see that Jesus give, uh, gave the disciples instructions and they followed them, and then came to have breakfast with him. Sometimes we just need to stop and think, and listen to that voice of Jesus guiding us, calling us to slow down and directing us to follow him instead of trying too hard all the time. Yes, I know this is easy said than done, but we can do it. And I think there's a lesson we need to learn or to hear. It is not always about our effort that produces good results but it is about Jesus taking control. Peter and other disciples listened to Jesus' instructions first, and when they did, that the outcome was outstanding. How often do we try to listen to Jesus' uh, guidance? 
I know that sometimes, if not most of the time, it's not clear to hear Jesus speaking to us. But I think we need to trust the Holy Spirit to listen to, um, and listen. One, one example to me is that uh, this water project, which you have heard about it. And now you play part in it. Three years ago, I felt strongly that I should deal with the water shortage in my village. I was actually in the village at that time, visiting. Everything started really well, and it was promising, until the government intervened and promised to bring the water from the Lake Victoria. I remember receiving a, a phone call at the New Wine Conference in Newark in 2018 and told my friends that we no longer need to collect money because the government is going to resolve the issue. And everyone was really excited. But then later on reflection, I was then taken aback and thought, maybe I had it wrong in relation to me getting involved. But on the other hand, I was really excited as the burden was lifted and taken off me. One day, two years later, I was informed that the government was unable to deliver their promise of bringing water to the village. I personally was very cross with my government when I received this news and I decided I wasn't going to get involved and to do anything about it. I do remember sharing this with a couple of people and I didn't want to talk about it widely anymore because I was fuming. Then, a couple of days before half term, twice I was woken up in the middle of the night by almost an audio or audible voice that I needed to deal with the water situation. I must admit, I have never had an, an intense feeling like this before, and I have never been woken up in a such a way before. I was awake, uh, I, I was awake sweating and feeling the urgency that I needed to do something about the water. But I still did not want to get involved. Then during our holiday in Lake District, in half term, I gave in as this was consuming me. I told my wife that I cannot live like this anymore and I needed to see what is happening in the village. So there, on our holiday, I contacted my family to find out the situation. I was horrified from what I was told because lots of the water sources were drying up. I asked some, for some photos, so, um, for, uh, for some sort of, some of which you have seen on the flyer. I then panicked and decided to find the possible ways of resolving the issue. I started praying about the situation with a couple of people in the church and my, uh, my prayer group at the college. A week ago, I received an email from John McGinley. Um, you you pro pro probably remember uh, the vicar of the Holy Trinity saying he has a dream about Kashenye and he believed it was to do with the water situation in a village. I can honestly say that at this point, I hadn't spoken to John about my dreams and my experience of being woken up in the middle of the night. So this was a confirmation that this time it was God guiding me to restart the project. Already, I have seen God's hand and his provision. And of course, St. Christopher's, you have given me a generous donation. And I'm so thankful for that. <clears throat> When I had a conviction about this water project in the beginning, 
I feel this came more from me. I felt more this came from, from me. But now I'm confident that it is God's plan and I just need to play my part. And thank you for playing your part in this also. Jesus is telling us to listen his guidance so that we can be fruitful. Sometimes we can try to be too clever, trying to do things in our own ways. Jesus can sort any, any situation, but he may not sort in this way or in a way we expect. I think for me this was, um, was and is a lesson. Jesus came and met the disciples and produced a miraculous catch. And I believe there's a miraculous catch in the form of the water project. And not only Jesus is guiding us, but he is actually calling us and he's saying, come and spend time with me. In this story, we see him preparing a breakfast for his disciples. He told them, sit down and have breakfast with me. He had prepared food for them. As we see here, when the disciples made it to the shore, he had a little campfire going and he was cooking them all a nice hot breakfast of bread and fish. Probably not, typ not um, typical English breakfast. After all, the emotion and the anguish of the crucifixion and the time between the crucifixion and the resurrection. And then the ele election and excitement following the resurrection. Jesus knew the importance of the disciples spending time with him. Time to enjoy being with him and maybe talking about and understanding more about all that has just happened. Jesus also wanted to refresh us and renew our strength. He sometimes wants to serve us, not always to be served. He's offering himself to be with us and guide us. Like those sto the story of Martha and, uh, and Mary in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. Jesus said this to Martha. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. But few things are needed, or oh, indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better. And it will never be taken away from her. Therefore, we are called sometimes to sit down and listen. Instead of doing things, just meditate on his word. To listen, to watch music, to spend time with Jesus, and to listen to what he wants to say to us. To you and me. Jesus is wanting you and me to just trust him and to spend time with him. Let us obey his guidance to our lives, even though this might be a difficult and challenging situation, but because he himself is good news and he promises to be with us in all circumstances. Let us run to him because he loves us and he has forgiven us so much in our lives. He doesn't judge us, but he embraces us. Let us accept his blessing to us, like when he cooked fish and bread to his disciples. He is wanting us to dwell in his word and prayers so that we might be nourished spiritually. Therefore, let us be ready to listen his gentle voice of guidance by setting aside the time to be with him. As we serve him, let us be ready to be renewed by him, 
the Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, and a friend who desires to spend time with me and you. He wants us to experience his goodness in our lives. Amen.